Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of BHBA Family Law Presents Direct Examination with Dan and Lauren. Along with Lauren Youngman from Youngman Reichstein, I'm Dan Bemmel, financial advisor and certified divorce financial analyst. During each episode of our show, we'll explore our guest's personal and professional history and dig into a meaningful legal topic. Please continue to join us for our upcoming episodes, always at 12.30 p.m. live on Zoom. Our final interview for 2022 will feature Judge Susan Lopez Giss on December 7th. We're also excited for our initial 2023 guest lineup, Peter Walzer, Samantha Klein, Glenn Schwartz, Judge Scott Gordon, Stacey Phillips, Grace General and Michael Hanasab, Aaron Gray and Chelsea Stevens, and Judge Harvey A. Silberman, with a few more to come later in the year. Lauren. Good afternoon, everyone. You'll receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Please take a moment to complete the survey that's included with your certificate. The Family Law section is sponsored by White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt, and Our Family Wizard. Our family, or we'll start with White Zuckerman, I guess. White Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt provides a wide variety of resources to complete almost any project, large or small. They also provide traditional accounting and tax practice services. We invite you to contact them to discuss your specific accounting needs and learn how they can be of service to you. Our Family Wizard is a secure co-parenting platform that supports divorced or separated parents in managing the daily responsibilities of raising children. Specialized features help co-parents organize routines, share files, track expenses and payments, check in at exchanges, send messages, and more, all while thoroughly documenting their activity. All right, that's it for our sponsors. Okay, thanks, Lauren. Today, we welcome the Melanie Mandels to the program. As we all know, Melanie is a partner of Wasser, Cooperman, and Mandels. She's a true lifer of the firm, also a true Angelino and is one of the most well-regarded and in-demand practitioners in town, evidenced by too many accolades and awards to list here. Melanie is also one of the most positive and joyful attorneys in the field that we've ever been around. We're so excited to have her on with us today. Uh, so much to get to, but first, Melanie, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. All right, this is going to be a fun one. You are... <laughs> You no, know, seriously, you are one of our, since we started this, you've been one of the most requested in-demand guests. Uh, whenever we ask people who else should we on, have on, your name is always one of the first that's mentioned. So lots to get to. Take us back a bit. Uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, what was your Los Angeles childhood like growing up in town, a precocious young Melanie? Yeah, wow. Okay. So from the beginning, I guess, um, so yeah, I was born here, born in Santa Monica, raised in West Los Angeles. I lived my whole life here, went to UCLA for college. I never really left. Um, childhood was, you know, a good one, all things considered. Um, some ups and downs, I think, certainly. Um, you know, I, my parents were divorced when I was really young, when I was about two or three years old. And so that, you know, I bring that up because that sort of shape a lot of how I practice family law. So being a product of divorce myself and seeing uh, how that, you know, how that impacts your childhood, going back and forth uh, between mom's house and dad's house. I was super lucky. Um, my parents had probably the best co-parenting relationship that, you know, could exist. A ton of, of respect for each other and love for each other. And um, my dad remarried uh, the most amazing woman uh, and, and started dating her when I was about four, I think. So she's been, and, and she's still my stepmom, and she's the most incredible stepmom. Uh, and she came with a daughter to the marriage as well. So I, I had the benefit of a, of a sister as well, who I adore. So yeah, it was, um, you know, definitely, I was, I was uh, not among the masses and being of a divorced family. Most of my friends had parents who were still together. So I remember that was a little bit unique, but my parents handled it in, in, a, in a great way and um, gave me a lot of love, at, you know, both homes. So. Why did you end up staying in Los Angeles for college? 
Um, probably because I was really comfortable in Los Angeles. I loved LA, um, very close with my family, who was pretty much all in LA by that time, and um, and my friends. And I just, you know, I I uh, I considered leaving. I applied to some schools that were out of state, and the end just stayed here. So, yeah. And what was LA? What was LA like for you back then? What kind of stuff were you getting into in the old days? I mean, oh, everything. Westwood was a real fun place to hang out, both growing up and then obviously going to UCLA, being there um, was sort of like a dream. I mean, when I was a kid, being in Westwood was sort of the epicenter of everything cool. And so uh, getting to be there for college was really a great experience too. Um, I don't know. I think I had, I, I, I was super involved in student council. I mean, I was one of those big time student government nerds way into it. I mean, there wasn't a school activity that I didn't attend. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that, was, that was fun. And then lots of time just outside, being in LA, outside Disneyland, Universal Studios, all those fun things that we just were able to do quite often was made for a pretty good childhood. And so were you always thinking about becoming an attorney? Was that early on or did that come later? No, I think I wanted to be either a singer or a dancer. And then um, when I discovered I couldn't sing and then I discovered <laughs> I couldn't dance, <laughs> I had to shift gears. I actually wanted to be a doctor. I remember seriously considering being a doctor, helping others, um, always really wanting to find a job that would make a difference. And uh, being a doctor really spoke to me. Uh, and then until I fainted at the high school blood drive, <laughs> and that kind of, because I was volunteering there, you know, student council, we would help people and read books to them while they were donating the blood. And then a nurse gave me a bag of blood to take over to the collection, you know, part of the room. And as I, w I remember looking at it and walking over, and then that's the last thing I remember. And apparently <laughs> I hit the deck and, uh, and then they, Next thing I know, they were had it like a wet towel on me and were giving me orange juice because I fainted. And I thought, you know, maybe maybe needles aren't for me. <laughs> too too squeamish for medicine, but not yeah. for the law. Eventually, <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, did your family have a big impact on guiding your your path into the law? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, my dad had gone to law school, but he was working in the corporate world. Uh, he had a very big impact on me. Um, growing up and uh, and I saw how hard he worked and he was telling me from a young age that I should be a lawyer like, oh, you know I think it started with things like we'd fight about my curfew you know but I think your curfew should be 11 o'clock and I'd say actually I think it should be midnight because you know so-and-so's curfew is this and so -and, and we would he would look at me and be like gee you never give up you know so you, you really should be a lawyer you should just be a lawyer because I would negotiate with him um, and my stepmom, you know, quite frequently. And so I think he thought that I had maybe my negotiation skills were pretty persistent <laughs> and convincing at times. So uh, I'm sure very annoying at others, but he, he used to always joke with me that I should be a lawyer. And then when it came time to decide what I was really going to do with my life, that's when we started talking about it more seriously. Mm. And so what else from your, uh, from your parents maybe put you on that path or, or colored how you looked at going, going into practice? Well, my, when, at one point when I was in my junior year at UCLA and my dad had said to me, you know, so what's next, right? Like what's next mm -hmm. after UCLA? And I was like, are you kidding me? And I just finally got a legal driver's license. I, you know, I could actually drink. Right, I was finally 21 years old. I can actually, you know, started really enjoying my life here. And uh, he wanted to still talk about what the future held, and I just wanted to go to parties at school and have a good time. And he, again, really impressed upon me this thought that he had about me being a lawyer, and that thought that I would I would do well in the field. And he finally just said to me, look, I'm going to break this down for you. You know, when you graduate, you should know how much it costs. You know, your lease payment on your little Jetta that you tool around town is, that's a couple, a couple hundred dollars a month. 
health insurance costs money every month. You know, there's this expense, that expense. And he said, and if you graduate from UCLA and you just enter the world, that's great. And I'll be proud of you and support you, but you should know that your expenses are your expenses starting the month after you graduate. You're on your own. He said, but if you go to law school, I will continue to help you for another few years. Mm. And that was really appealing. That was real. Yeah. I was not ready for the real world. I was absolutely not ready for the real world. So he he really. I remember coming home from that dinner and telling my roommates that I thought I was going to law school, and they were like, "Really? What made you make that decision?" And I told them, broke down the conversation, and they said to me that moment, they were like, "You are going to law school," <laughs> and they had a vested interest in that too because they were you know, living with me and a roommate and they wanted me to continue to be able to pay rent. So they liked that idea as well. Nice. <laughs> All right. So he won you over with his bribe or offer or whatever we want to call it. Uh, yes. He also, he also promised to buy me a Porsche when I graduated. Oh. Okay. But that, I let him off the hook in a moment of weakness. <laughs> when I was finishing law school, he said to me, you know what? I think it's time for us to go car shopping. Right. And I, like, dad, you know what? You've done so much for me. It's okay. I, you, you don't need to get me the car. I'll, I'll buy, I'll buy the car myself one day. And he took it and run. And my stepmom <laughs> was so funny because she was like, oh no, you should hold him to this. Like he wants to, you said he would do this. You should hold him to it. I, I never, uh, I never enforced that promise. I, I, I did the car on my own and it made it, I think probably a little bit more special to have done that by myself. You didn't learn the lesson about not uh, negotiating against yourself, right? Yeah, I, I, my my negotiation skills were in a weak moment, apparently. <laughs> um, so after you uh, got, went to law school and and graduated, did you know what area you wanted to specialize in? How did you get started in family law? So I actually got started in family law by accident, and that was because I. Uh, when I was considering being a lawyer, I thought, well, I want to get a job working at a, at a law firm, not a family law firm, really, just a law firm. I wanted to see what it was like working for a law firm. And it just so happened that my roommate at the time had a job at a law firm. And she mentioned to me, you know, I think I heard in the kitchen that the firm next door was hiring and how great would that be? We could go to work together. You know, you'd be Carpool. the firm next door and we, right, it'd be social, yeah. right? You could, are you getting the sense that social is very yeah. important to me? Okay. So, How many people could you fit in the Jetta was like the <laughs> organizing right. principle, that's right? right? That's right. Yeah. So we, uh, I, she introduced me, I came in for the interview and I was interviewed by the firm manager and Dennis Wasser. So that was 1992. And I was hired as a file clerk uh, for the firm. And uh, I was 20 years old. And, uh, and yeah, and that was it. And I have never worked anywhere else since. So I, I was clerking for the firm through, uh, through the rest of college and then through law school. And then I became an associate attorney when I graduated from law school and then became a partner later on. That's amazing. And we'll get into some other parts of that on the timeline. But in that in those first days as a law clerk, were you hooked immediately or did it take anything, whether the people or the process or the work itself to really yeah. kind of catalyze that vision? It was 100 percent the people. Oh, I, wow. I never had, you know, again, I was a little bit on the fence about going to law school in the first place. Um. And I certainly had no vision of what type of lawyer I wanted to be at that mm -hmm. point, you know, what type of field I wanted to go to. But working at the firm was then called Wasser, Rosenson and Carter and working for that firm and the people there, it was, it was just a joy to come to work. Everyone was so kind and smart and reasonable and watching them do what they did. I just developed a real, real admiration for the way that that firm worked and uh, and the people that were there it was it was like a family, it really was, and it still is. In those first years as a as a clerk before you passed the bar and became an attorney, what was the work like, and what did you learn from the right off the bat? Yeah, so I started really in the beginning just being a filing clerk, right? So all I really needed to know was the alphabet, and I was. <laughs> 
I would crush it at the job. So, so I was <laughs> just filing. And then what happened was over time, I just developed relationships with the attorneys and they would ask me, Hey, do you want to do this project for me? Or, um, you know, they knew that I was eager to learn. And I think I had made that pretty clear that I wanted to, to do whatever, you know, whatever I could to further my, my uh, experience in the law firm. And so I started doing research projects even before I was in law school. I started learning. I mean, I came to, I came to, uh, to law school already knowing about LexisNexis and Westlaw and all that. I already knew what it was and, and had kind of taught myself a little bit about how to use it with the help of some of the, the other attorneys at the firm. And so I, I was up for whatever project. And then once it, we started, they would ask me to research an issue. That's when I thought, okay, I really like this. You know, I really like reading how the cases guide you and in, in determining how a set of circumstances in one case might rely upon, you know, how the law is applicable to the cases that we have. I thought that was really interesting. And then talking to the attorneys about it and then watching them work. I was just, it was really, I was sold. I really was. Was so, I mean, that planted the seed pretty early, but were there any, did you struggle with any of the parts of family law at that point? Or did you have any doubts about whether it was the right fit? I really didn't. I, I, figured I love this group of people and that it would be really an honor to work with them. I could tell that they practiced at the highest level. Like these were really high. I could tell even from the client list, right? That mm. these were very sought after attorneys. They had, you know, every celebrity divorce that was happening in town, one of the parties was a client of this firm. And, uh, and just kind of reading through things, I was asked to do things like summarize deposition transcripts. And just reading through these things, it was incredible, the, the fact patterns and, and who they were representing. That's so great. So you, you talked about the firm obviously has been through a few iterations in terms of the partners. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about a, a, some of those people. I'll start with Dennis, right? Yeah. The, I think you call him the godfather at one point, right? Yeah, he's, that was sort of how I envisioned him. He's sort of larger than life. He... Um, I spent a lot of time as a as a young lawyer watching Dennis in court, watching him at depositions, watching him in settlement conferences, and I think I learned more from Dennis than anybody else. That's that's for sure. I mean, he like he, what? Tell us a little more. Well, the the way he had a command of the courtroom. I mean, just starting with the court the court mm -hmm. Anytime I could go to court with him, um, I would always take that opportunity for sure. Just watching him, I would see how he, how he presented evidence, how he presented arguments in the court. And it was so compelling. And it was really interesting because I watched others, you know, not only his opposing counsel, but also while we were waiting to be heard, watching other lawyers in the courtroom. I love that. And I could kind of see what I thought worked and what I thought didn't work. And it was, I learned early on really mainly from Dennis, I would say that it's definitely not he who yells the loudest who wins. You know, we, I would watch, we'd have these opposing counsels flailing their arms and yelling and screaming and saying the nastiest things about the other party. And then Dennis would just calmly go to the podium, open up his, his binder. He always had perfect notes in the most perfect handwriting you've ever seen. And he would just deliver this argument in the most calm, compelling, persuasive, logical way that there was a, there was no way he wasn't th that the judge was going to see it any way other than the way he thought. Right? It was. I mean, I was like, I'm sold. You know, <laughs> he he really uh, he he really has a a beautiful way of lawyering. He really does. How, did you have an opportunity to see him handle other attorneys outside of the courtroom or, or yeah. how he communicated yeah, even, with clients? Even, um, gosh, I hope he watches this. Let's just see <laughs> how I feel about him. Um, he, he would, we would walk down the hall and every single person would say, would, you know, come off the bench and say hi and shake his hand. And he would, just the level of respect that he had in the courtroom 
And sure, I mean, we, he had, there were cases where we had different, different positions like any, any, in any other case. And, uh, but he just handled it with such a level of class and, and presented the evidence always in a very concise way. And, um, yeah, but everybody, I, I never saw him have a, uh, have a, a argument with another lawyer. I mean, never, it was, it was always just very positive. And even if the issues were very intense, the fact pattern was emotional, et cetera, he would kind of get through it and then shake the other lawyer's hand at the end of the day and say, you know, oh, you, you know, golfed at Brentwood lately. You know, I thought I thought, which is very, it, it, this was business, but to present, present your case the best way you could, but the lawyer relationships were always really important to him. What about, that from him what about uh, David Rosenson? You mentioned yeah. that he was one of your mentors. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. David was fantastic. I mean, he was you, like out of central casting, I would say for your, your, your rigid, um, you know, very traditional partner in a family law firm where he expected you to work and, uh, and because that's how he was, he had an incredible work ethic, but it was funny. I mean, I remember as a brand new lawyer, he would come to my office and knock on the door, open the door. And he'd say, good morning. What time did you get here? But before you answer that, you should know, I just felt the hood of your car. <laughs> like, Sneaky. Okay. Nice. <laughs> so he, uh, you know, Laura and I were always a bit scared of him because he was really, um, you know, we were always so scared to disappoint him. He was, he worked so hard and he expected us to work hard well, but he was just an absolute love. I, I adored David Rose and he taught me so much. He taught me, um, the art of really writing persuasive arguments. He was an incredible writer, Susan Carter too. I mean, the most incredible writer. And I would start drafting, you know, for both of them, I would draft an argument and then they would edit it and we would go over it together. And I would see exactly how to become a better writer. And I, and I, I really loved, I always loved writing. And that was that's one of the things I love about family law, the writing, the persuasiveness part of it. And submitting a brief that you can feel really proud of that, wow, I think I really took this set of facts and made the most compelling argument that I could with it. And I, I really like reading this brief. What about your current partners now? Or do you, what are you still learning even as a season name on the door attorney? Yeah. So, well, I mean, starting with Laura Wasser. So when I started at the firm as a clerk, she was in law school and she was, when I talk about family and feeling this the great feeling of the energy in the firm. Uh, she was a huge part of that. And I just looked up to her then, and I still do now. I mean, she's, she's incredible. She's, uh, we've been practicing family law together now for 25 years. I can't even believe it's been that long. Uh, but um, I, I have such a level of respect and admiration for her. She's, she's a real powerhouse. She's so smart. She really cares about our clients. She cares about the end result. She works so, so hard. So that's another part of the dynamic of the family law firm that's been really important to me. And my other partners here, we have, I feel so lucky because especially through COVID and working from home, what I miss the most was seeing everybody and being together because everyone here, I have a personal relationship with as well, not just professional. And I, I adore the people who work here. I feel like we have the best lawyers and um, we're so fortunate to have this group of people. Everyone's different. We all sort of add different opinions to the mix. I mean, our firm meetings are funny because we'll start on a topic that we think we'll cover quickly in 10 minutes. And then it just kind of goes down these different paths where people are like, what about this? And what about this? And why well, have a case about this? And we could talk for hours about our cases and different ways to handle the same fact pattern, which is, in my opinion, what makes a, a lawyer thrive is you is not having tunnel vision, but really keeping your eyes open to different ways of viewing uh, a, a, an approach, a, a different approach to one that you might automatically come to. And I think the lawyers here, the brainstorming sessions we have, I, I love it. Early on, uh, when you were talking about how Dennis and David and Susan kind of helped train you and how you learned from them, when were you ready? When did it either feel like you were ready to get uh, 
in front of a judge or when did they feel like you were ready? How did you start taking those next steps um, in developing your career? Well, my first court appearance was a surprise. It was not what I thought was, I, I, it wasn't planned, I should say. <laughs> I was uh, helping David Rosenson on a case. And, uh, and as we're sitting at council table, I was kind of saying to him you know, before what the case was called, I said, don't forget about this. And, oh, and, you know, and here's this if you need it. And, and don't forget to make that argument. And he looked at me and he goes, you know what? You're handling this today. It's like, you know this cold. You're, you're handling it. I said, no, 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 excuse me. I'm not. He's like, Melanie, you're prepared. You know this. I had written the outline of his argument and everything for him, just bullet points. And so he said, no, you're handling it. And I, he stood up when the case was called and he told the judge and your honor, this is my, you know, my associate and she will be handling the argument today. And the judge, oh, that's wonderful. You know, welcome to the courtroom, whatever. Anyway, uh, I handled the, the argument and I, I really was sort of winging it, although I was prepared, right? Because I had prepared David. So, uh, and it, it luckily by the grace of God, it went well, <laughs> but I was not really, he really threw me in to, to the wolves. Let's, let's say that. And it was a good way. It was a good thing. Cause I don't know if I would have been ready to jump off yet. And how did uh, opposing counsel respond? Um, well, so it was Thoral Trope, who was our <laughs> opposing counsel. And, uh, I don't know, you know, he, he may have, in hindsight, he probably didn't love that David did that to him, but, uh, but it, it worked out just fine. And Sorrel forevermore was always so kind to me and would, you know, kind of joke. He would always knock on my door when he was at the office to say hello. And he would always say, are they treating you well here? You know, kind of joking with me. And even when I was really pregnant, one time he came into my office and said, how's the maternity leave policy here? Because we have a great one at Trump and Trump. <laughs> and he would say it openly in front of everybody. It was very funny, but um, I always had a lot I, a lot of respect for Sorrel, and I think he did for me too. So. so now after all these years, do you find yourself in the role of mentoring uh, younger or newer attorneys at your office? Uh, yes, and I love that. I love that. So, you know, one of the partners we have here is Bruce Cooperman, and he is got to be the most knowledgeable family law lawyer around. And so he has was a tremendous resource for me. He joined the firm in 2020 and was a tremendous resource for me. He was, he's always, and still is all these years later, going to him for everything. And so I'm trying to do for others what he did for me. I don't have nearly the, he's the, he's the one who just remembers the name of a case off the top of his head in a moment's notice. So I'm more of a, you know, I need to look this up really quick or let's look this up together. I have to find the case. I don't have it on the top of my mind the way he does. But I, that working with him really has shaped my legal learning. And I, I try to do that for others here. So I always have an open door policy. I love to talk about the law. I love to help people kind of find arguments and see it a different way. You know, like maybe think about handling it this way or maybe citing this case or making this argument. I, I love, uh, I do love the law. So if that's how you teach, how do you attract talent to begin with? How do you find and cultivate and bring in new people into that culture that you've helped build. Yeah, it's, we, we haven't had a lot of turnover in the firm over the years, which has been very fortunate, I think. Um, but we have, it, it sort of somehow comes together. We'll, we'll be told through, you know, one of, the, one of the attorneys here will say, oh, this person approached me, they're looking for a job, or they know somebody who's looking for a job. And we, we do get resumes, although the world is so different now. I feel like we used to get a ton of resumes. I don't think we get a lot of resumes anymore. It's mm. kind of a, a different, you know, post or, or still in COVID world, I suppose. It's a, it's a bit different, but um, we've been through experiences of ha being opposite people. And then sometimes those associates will reach out if they're looking for, to make a move. Or again, if we just hear through word of mouth that someone is looking, that's how we've been able to, um, to bring people over and and have some great additions to the team. Do you think that the 
practice of family law is attractive enough to young new young attorneys or that the bar is doing enough to encourage or entice young attorneys to join our practice? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a good question. I, I, it's funny when you tell people that you're a family law lawyer, they always go, how, like, how did you decide to do that? You know, how did you get into it? It doesn't seem probably very, very appealing to most people in law school. They're probably drawn to more, uh, you know, enticing areas of the law. But I think it's, for me, one of the things about family law, in addition to just being so moved by the group of people that I met my first job at a law office, was that there is a lot of, um, uh, there, there's a lot of emotion that is involved in it. And I think when I was doing my undergrad, one of the career choices I was, I was considering was going into like therapeutic world, right? Mm -hmm. So going, be, being a therapist, I thought that I loved all my psychology classes. I thought those were really interesting. And so I think with family law, you really, it's a, it's a combination. I'm certainly not a licensed therapist. But I tell my clients that all the time because being a family lawyer is sort of par for the course, right? They want to know, what should I do? What do you, what do you think I should tell my kids? How do I handle this situation? What, what message should I communicate to my ex? I, we love it when I always encourage people to have therapists. If they don't have a therapist, I think it's a great idea to have one to help you get through the process because that's a tremendous resource. But I, I, I think that's part of what it, you have to be drawn to, to being able to jump in there and really help people in order to be interested in family life. Well, I think you you kind of made the transition for me. I want to talk a little bit more about your practice and your day to day. Talked about the therapeutic aspect of the practice. Do you think that means that you gravitate towards certain clients or certain types of clients gravitate towards you? I think so. I think over time, uh, I've sort of developed certain clients come to me. And it's usually those clients that are interested in settling their case, right? They don't have this big quest to destroy the other person. And I've had, I've had uh, clients come to me many a time and they've been really upset and really emotional and want to go for the jugular and they want to make the other person pay because they're so upset about the circumstances that led to the divorce. And I have said, you know, I just don't think I'm the lawyer for you on numerous occasions because I just don't, I'm not, not only do I not like to do that, I don't think I'm particularly good at it. Like I, some of these strategic things that people do where it's like this underhand, underhanded legal maneuvering and I, to, to try to get some advantage to really screw the other person, I, I just, it, it's not really in my DNA. I don't think that way. I'm a really positive person. I'm a very solution-oriented person. Even in my personal life, if there's a, some kind of a problem, I'm always trying to find the solution. Like if something at my house breaks, I, 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 my husband always jokes with me, it's like the sun doesn't set until you fix that problem. Like I, I, I'm just on it. I was like, oh, there's an issue. I got to get the handyman. I, it's just how I don't like lingering problems. I don't do conflict in my personal life. I don't, I've never had a like blow up with a friend or a family member. Never, never. I don't do conflict. It's not in me. I'm just, I'll find the problem. I'll find a way to solve, like address, you know, address the problem head on and find a way to solve it in a way that makes everyone hopefully feel okay. Um, so that's just, if I'm, so I'm not the one who's going to stir the pot and make a, a disaster out of a family law matter. So I have no desire to do that. I just, I'm like looking from day one, I'm looking for the finish line. How am I going to get this case done for this family? What are the options? What are the fair resolutions? And truly the good part is, is there's so many other great family law lawyers in town who've been doing this for as long or longer than I have that we can take any set of circumstances, no matter how complicated it is, and we can together work as a team to, to figure out a range of outcomes where we can stay with re a reasonable level of certainty. It's, this is where it's going to land, right around here. Mm. And so let's just get to that and start focusing on the details. And, and that's the way that I, I just, I love it when, when judgments are signed. It's like my favorite thing. So would it be accurate to say that a majority of your practice now is not litigation? Yes. Yes. I, I do 
mainly settlement. I write a lot of prenuptial agreements and postnuptial agreements. I really enjoy that too. I enjoy the creativity that goes into those. I really like helping people. If people come to you and they're like, oh, I have to do a prenup. They don't want to do it. They think it's going to be the most miserable experience. And I love it when people say at the end of it, you know, that wasn't so bad. And, and they understand now what the law is and they've come up with an agreement with their spouse about how money is going to be treated during the marriage and what would happen if God forbid there was a divorce. It, it, I think it's, it's great. I think prenuptial agreements are, um, are a wonderful, wonderful stepping stone to a marriage where you have an understanding about finances. I mean, how many times have we had clients who come to us and they've been married for decades and they have no idea what the finances are, not a clue. They have no idea what community property means, what separate property means. They have no idea how money was handled during their marriage. They're, they maybe just signed a tax return, but never really looked at it. They just have no clue. And it's not their fault. You know, you're, no one says you really need to do this. And so then unfortunately a divorce comes around and it's so scary. And sometimes the money was so commingled during the marriage that it ends up that divorce is really time consuming and expensive because we have to, as you know, right, get in there and figure out going back decades, what was separate property, what was community property. And so I'm a big believer in, in having an agreement in place so that you know how to handle it during your marriage. And I, I really do enjoy writing those agreements. How do you deal with difficult clients or maintain client control on those cases that slip through your initial <laughs> screening? Oh, there have been some. <laughs> yeah, there have definitely been some. I'm like, gosh, this client did not present as a crazy person, <laughs> <laughs> crazy, angry person. Um, yeah, I I try my best to keep the case on the settlement path no matter what, right? I, I, I try not to be the lawyer who says like, okay, well, we could try that. Sure, let's just give it a go. I, I like to try to convince the client if at all possible, to stay on the settlement track and leave litigation as a last resort. Um, I, you know, I've, I've had, I've said to clients before, you know, the only difference really between whether you're going to litigate this issue or whether you're going to settle it is how much you're going to pay me and how much the, your, your spouse is going to incur in legal fees as well. So, I, I, I sometimes when people understand that fighting that fight is going to just cost them money, that puts it in perspective. They have to do a cost benefit analysis there. And the other thing that I've shared with clients over the years that comes to mind is that sometimes if clients get really angry at their spouse and they want to, you know, they want to battle, they want to uh, duke it out. I you know, want him to pay. I want her to suffer or whatever it might be. And if they have kids, right. You know, sometimes clients think this battle is going to be, um, there's going to be some great victory at the end of the day, and they're going to feel so vindicated. And what I've tried to share with clients is I know you've probably seen movies where that happens, and you've read books where that's happened, and maybe you've heard a story or two about that happening. But winning in family law is really not what it's cracked up to be, because you still, when your divorce is done and one day your divorce will done, will be done, you are still co-parents with your spouse for the rest of your life. And you, this is not the grand finale. This is not the final chapter in this book of your relationship with a person. This is one chapter in a very long novel that has many chapters yet to write where you're going to be at events, birthday parties, graduations, weddings, you'll be grandparents together. I mean, you have so much ahead. So don't fixate on the battle because you're creating the stage for how you're going to live the rest of your life. And, and also certainly how your kids see, you know, when you have kids, your kids are looking to you to be role models and how you conduct yourself in your divorce is how is something that's going to have a material impact on their childhood and who so they are as yeah, that's awesome. I love the like empowerment's the victory, not the dollar, not every last penny. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So if that's how you deal with the clients, the easy ones and the difficult ones, really, right? 
how do you deal with the opposing how do you deal with opposing counsel especially the difficult opposing counsel so so you know it's funny over the years i've learned and as a young lawyer you get a, a a really aggressive letter from a really aggressive opposing counsel and they're basically telling you and your client to stick it you know where the sun doesn't shine and you look at it you're like oh my god this is so awful and again i'm not a confrontational person so i look at it and i take it personally and i would be so upset now i just realized I'm just going to take the high road. So I don't care how many letters you send me taking unreasonable positions and misstating the facts and all of that. I'm just, my letter of response is always going to be cordial and it's going to set the record straight and it's going to seek to move the case forward. Because what I've learned is that bullies get really tired of sending these bully letters if they're not getting a rise out of you. If you're just going to every time send them something and say, I'm going to receive your letter and you're basically completely wrong, um, you know, but uh, for the record, you know, I don't agree with any of the contents of your letter, but here's how I think we should move forward. And you just, you let it very, make it very clear that they don't, they're not getting to you. I feel like that, um, that sets the course. Now I will tell you, I've had clients who have wanted me to send a letter back and I, I can't stand it when lawyers just write letters to their clients where they're just sending these completely self-serving letters. It makes me crazy. And, and, uh, and even lawyers will send you a letter, you know, telling you to shove it. And then you talk to them the next day and it's like, oh, hey, Mel, how's it going? It's like, wait a minute, you just sent me a really aggressive letter yesterday. Like, oh, you know, I, I didn't mean it. I, I didn't, you know, I was just, I was for the client. I, I really try not to do that. The other thing is, I always write letters thinking that a judge might read it one day, right? And mm. how do, how is that letter going to impact my case? So, and that's one of the points too that I've learned as a lawyer, um, the importance of writing really good, reasonable letters and the importance of confirming your settlement offers in writing. So like the one time I had a big case that went to trial and it was me and Dennis Wasser and Bruce Cooperman and Amy Rice and Mary Yates through this big trial on this case that we tried to settle for years. And we had written seven settlement offers and they were all very detailed. And we would go to a settlement conference and then we would write a letter saying confirming this is the offer we made at the settlement conference and it's open for the next, you know, blank days or whatever. And so the other person never, never accepted any of those settlement offers. And we went to court after years and she had made this crazy request for attorney's fees. And we did really well at the trial. And then there was a bifurcated hearing on the fees. And the judge, I couldn't believe it. He took the stand and he said, you know, just on ruling on the fees, he said to the, uh, the opposing party, he said, you know, I read the seven settlement letters that went over in this case. And he said, I could tell you that, uh, and you probably have seen, given the rulings that I made in this case, uh, that you should have accepted that first offer. Mm. But then if you weren't going to accept that offer, you, you really should have accepted the second one, you know, because they progressively, all these offers got better and better. And we did phenomenally well um, at that hearing. And it was really because we had memorialized all of our efforts to settle and all of our letters were so inherently reasonable. So that, that's part of the reason why I try not to get in the muck of, of, the, the letter the, the letter wars with other lawyers. Taking a, a step sort of back for a moment, how did you build your practice or your own client base in the first place? Uh, so yeah, that happened sort of naturally, which I was happy. To, I, I was part of a networking uh, group early on. I was asked by uh, a, a woman who I still am I work with to this day, um, Rachel Kane of UBS. She had uh, approached me. We had some clients in common, and she had approached me about joining this group that she was a part of, which was young professional women uh, in, in, in a group where they would meet for dinner once a month and talk about issues that they were facing in their practices and just to get to know other people. So I thought that was a good idea, and I did it, and I met some of my most favorite people in that group. So estate planning attorneys, um, you know, people in, in small businesses, uh, 
financial advisors, accountants, et cetera. And so that, that ended up being a, a very great group to be affiliated with. And, and then I think over time, just I've had lots of referrals from former clients, which I love. I've had uh, lots of referrals from other lawyers that I've worked with. Uh, you know, business lawyers, entertainment lawyers, lots of business managers, uh, you know, advisors. I would say generally just advisors. Lots of estate and uh, tax and estate planning attorneys have given me, um, you know, has sent clients my way. So that's what about it? Actually built. Yeah, if those are the relationships outside of the, or not outside, but outside of the practice, what about the relationships with your clients? Have you maintained? Do you keep relationships with your clients after the cases are over? Yes. Yes. I mean, not all of them. I think sometimes, even though I really do develop a friendship with the client throughout the course of just, you know, I always joke, you go from, as a family law lawyer, you go from not knowing somebody at all to being number one on their auto dial, right? Like they just Mm. wanted, you now are in charge of everything that means anything to them. Their children their money, you know, their home, their assets, like everything, right? So you go from not knowing someone to having them be very attached to you. And sometimes I think it's, you know, the clients, the relationship is short-lived because maybe you're just a memory of like a not great time in their life, right? Like, oh, my divorce lawyer, like, I'm, kinda, I'm glad that's done. And if I see her, I'll be so happy to see her, but I'm not going to pursue a friendship with her after the divorce because it's, you know, post-traumatic stress of the divorce itself. But, um, but I do actually have great relationships with a lot of my former clients and it's, yeah, just, it's awesome. that's one of the benefits. And we do get to meet really great people in this job. I mean, you really, and, and you do get to know how they, how they work. Um, someone once said, you know, criminal lawyers see bad people, at their best and family law lawyers see good people at their worst. Right. So you really do get to know, and I might have said that wrong, but, um, but the point is you do, people are really raw. Like when they're getting divorced, like, what do I do? Here's the circumstances. And I mean, how many times you talk to somebody and they always say, okay, this is privilege. Right. And it's, and then they, they think they're going to tell you something that's shocking and you just kind of, you're okay. And because we've seen it all, we've heard it all. We really, really have. I mean, it takes quite a bit for us to get shocked at this point by a by a story. And there's some really good ones out there, <laughs> and we just keep them secret, which is which is really great. That's the best part, and, you know. When friends are like, "God, you must have the best stories," and you're like, "Yes, I do." How about those Dodgers? Or you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, yeah, it is that it, the so much of what you have to what you get to see and learn you take with you, and I yeah. we do hours just on that. I'm sure even with the names sure. redacted, right? Uh, and we have so many more questions that we would we would uh, ask you, but let's pivot a little bit to a legal topic uh, with some of our time left. Uh, we want to talk about the duty of candor. Uh, in rules of professional conduct. So just big picture, what are some of the lessons that you've learned about honesty, reputation, duty of candor in terms of the facts and the law uh, as a practitioner since you've been, since you've been doing it? Yeah, I I think quite a lot. Um, To me, being honest is so important. Your integrity as a lawyer is just paramount. And, and you have to carry that with you in all aspects of being a lawyer so that you know, you know if I, I speak with other lawyers every day, right? And I'd like to think that they know that if I'm telling them something, um, that, I, that I really mean it, that I, I'm not just bullshitting, right? I'm, if I'm making a proposal, it's because I've done the homework and I've run the numbers and I feel like this is, this is something that makes sense. Um, I'm never going to misrepresent to the court. I've never done it. I have zero interest in, in misrepresenting to anybody. I just, I think being honest is and saving your reputation, keeping it as pristine as possible is, is so, so important. And I've learned a lot from watching other lawyers not do the same. I've been in court, we all have, where other lawyers are making misrepresentations about cases. And I think what happens is 
from what I've what I've heard, we discussed this in my study groups, and I've discussed it with a, a few lawyers over or a few judges over the years as well. How certain lawyers they come in and they make all of these very exaggerated claims, then that lawyer has a reputation among the family law community as just sort of exaggerating and not being as, as you can't trust the representations that are being made. And I think that that, so with, with judges, you know, if you, they've got to think, wow, this is really interesting. This lawyer, this is like the fifth case this month where it's the same fact pattern, you know, isn't that interesting? You know, <laughs> the same, the same claims are being made that the same fact pattern was occurring in five different families. It, it, it kind of, it, 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 it's not logical, it's not reasonable, it's not believable. And so I, I've seen it happen. I actually, well, there was one time where I was in court in Santa Barbara and the other lawyer stood up, it was her RFO. She stood up and gave this presentation about the her opening and it was so off base. It was so inaccurate. And I had my notes because I so rarely go to court that when I go, I am overly prepared. Like I don't sleep the night before. I am, I just, I'm worried. Like, do I have all my cases printed out? Do I have all the sites? Do I, I, I gotta be ready. And so I was ready with my outline of my argument. And I'm like, where do I even go with this? Because everything she's saying is I'm not prepared for because it's not right. As far as I know, there's no evidence to support anything she's saying. And so I stood up and I said, your honor, I was very prepared with my argument, but I have to admit I'm a bit perplexed because I was really moved by the opening statement that opposing counsel just made, but I, I don't think she's talking about this case. And the judge was like, you know, and, and it was, and I said, here's what is happening in our case. Here's what the facts are in our case. And, and it was so funny. The lawyer on the other side admitted, she was like, oh my God, you're, I, totally got it mixed up in the moment with another case <laughs> she admitted but I, I i but she'd also really greatly embellished and exaggerated but the thing is for me i just want if if, if i'm going to court and i'm making a representation about the facts right then i want the judge to know these are credible these are vetted right this is she's not coming here to try to know me or give some line of bs these are these are actual tried and true representations that have been vetted and her arguments are consistent with the law, right? She's not, she's not just telling me that the law gives me the authority to do something with no sight. Like there is, there is a sight there. I had an experience um, once in court where uh, it was a child support uh, hearing and I represented the mother who was the payor of child support and the other side was trying to include phantom income in the child support calculation. And we had our friends accountant testify, you know, phantom income is not really income received and it's not part of the gross cash flow because you don't actually receive it. And, you know, that, and the judge was like, mm, yeah, followed it. Yes. Okay. Understood. And the other lawyer kept arguing that phantom income, there's nothing in the family law code that says that phantom income shouldn't be included as cash flow. And the judge was like, but counsel, She's not actually receiving it. It's phantom income. And he kept going on and on and on. And the judge finally said, counsel, if you try to tell me that phantom income is income actually received one more time, I'm going to ask you to leave my courtroom. <laughs> so, like, so you just, so those are experiences I've seen where the misrepresentations of the law and, and of just logic, I, I, I think, end up hurting some lawyers that, that take it too far. Have you ever had the opposite experience where your you know, reputation for honesty has benefited you in a case? Oh, yes. All the time. All the time. I had an experience uh, years ago with one uh, judge that I had worked with on this case. Um, and it was, a, it was a really great case. And we had worked really hard on it. And we settled it. And the judge helped us settle the case. And so he knew how hard that we and the opposing counsel were working on settling this case. And he would say, like, I love working with lawyers. He said just when he settled, he goes, I'm going to miss having you guys in my courtroom because you're such good lawyers. And I really love, you know, watching you work out this issue. So anyway, we got it done. And then a, a, 
a while later, I go to court um, on another matter. And he was like, oh, you know, he saw me in, in the, the, uh, the, the courtroom and he said, Ms. Gandalf, are you here on the blank matter? Uh, did you bring the judgment? Because we were working on the judgment. And I told him that I was going to be bringing it shortly. And I said, Your Honor, I'm not here on that today. I will be returning shortly with that, hopefully, you know, later in the week. But I'm number 12 on your calendar. And he goes, Oh, well, isn't that nice? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, good to see you. And then the, by the time we went to second call, the lawyer on the other side, like, kind of signaled me to come out of the courtroom. And he said, I don't know what just happened in there, but I'm not going back in there with you. Like, there is no way I'm going to win this hearing today. And so when you see that, you know, the like judges respect you because they know you work hard and you're honest and you do a good job and you're citing the law correctly and you're making the most persuasive arguments, it does help. So, and um, yeah, it's that case settled too. Those are all great stories and we would hope that all cases would go that way, but looking at things a little more cynically, do you think that the court does enough to enforce these rules or, or to, you know, is it true that a lawyer's reputation for, for honesty really has an impact on how the court perceives them or do a lot of people really just get away with it? I think, I think that's a good question. And for me, again, positive thinker, eternal optimist, I like to believe that carrying yourself with honesty and integrity is, is, has great rewards inside and outside the courtroom. Um, but I do, I have had cases where the lawyer on the other side uh, has acted unreasonably, the parties on the other side, together with their lawyers, have acted unreasonably. And at the end of the day, um, even you know, notwithstanding that, the fee order that they receive is really substantial because of the disparity of assets between the two clients. So it's, it's hard. There have been times where I've thought, gosh, I wish that judge would have really considered the tactics and the behavior that that took place in this case and making that fee order but in lots of cases like the one i talked about before where that judge really did consider was very moved by the efforts that we had made at reaching a reasonable settlement and uh, it definitely guided his decision on the fees like in a major major way so so there are instances where it, it it does it does work, but I I hear what you're saying. We we will we are always hoping that the judges take that into consideration that they that they don't reward lawyers for for just going off the rails with completely unsupported um, and oftentimes truly atrocious claims that that we are required to defend against. I mean I know some of the topics of the other direct examinations have been. The domestic violence claims and coercive control and how a lot of um, you know we, we actually interviewed an associate years ago and she told us that another law firm where she was working she was looking to make a move because she didn't like the feel of where she was uh, she didn't like the way that they processed their cases and she said you know we start every case with how did your ex wrong you like that's like the open you know tell me all the times that he or she yelled at you. Tell me all the times oh. that he or she, uh, you know, was was angry in front of your children. Tell me all the time, you know, this, this, where, and the potential associate that we were interviewing. I mean, it was it was it was hard to hear, but then at the end of the day, we weren't really shocked. So uh, for us, it's the opposite. It's like let's talk. Give us the facts that we need to try to reach a resolution. That's fair and reasonable and in the best interest of your family, certainly including your kids. And if we cannot resolve it right out of the gates, then we have the courthouse, but that's really, let's see what we can do to, to settle it first. I wish we had another hour. This is crazy. Um, there's so much we didn't get to. Uh, I, 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 but I do want to ask one more question before yeah, we go. I, I know we're up against it. So let's zoom all the way back out. You've shared so much. I want to kind of put a cap on it and just ask you what your what you want your overall legacy to be in the family law community, maybe more broadly in the Los Angeles community. Community, how are you? How do you think about that? I guess I would say just to be remembered as somebody who who worked really hard to 
help people. That's really mm. how I feel about this job. It's tough. There are really hard days. There are really good days. Um, but I think it's rewarding because when you when you take a case from the beginning where the family is just in such disarray and you're able to help them move on and help them, you know, get through it and then find a way to co-parent moving forward. And then I see, you know, the client or the, the spouse, right, the ex at some event or just about town and have them be like, oh my God, we're good. You know, everything's good. It's like, that's to me what it's all about. So just, just that I really tried, that I really put my heart into it. And that I really, I, I try to make a better life for, for other people. Well, Melanie, thank you so much. That's all the time we have for today, unfortunately. Um, everyone watching, please mark your calendars now and join us for our next episode. They'll all be at 12.30 p.m. Judge Susan Lopez-Giss will be on December 7th. And then on the first Wednesday of each month in 2023, Peter Walzer, Sam, Samantha Klein, Glenn Schwartz, Judge Scott Gordon, Stacey Phillips, uh, Grace Jamra and Michael Hanasab, Aaron Gray and Chelsea Stevens, and then Judge Harvey A. Silverman. Thank you to Genna, Kathleen, and Belinda at the bar, the Family Law Executive Committee led by Aaron Gray and Chelsea Stevens, and of course our section sponsors. Uh, and most importantly, thank you again, Melanie, for being here and thank sharing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.